My name is Bruce Herbert, and it's my pleasure to, to talk to you, the CNI community today, about supporting university uh, resilience during the pandemic through Vivo, the open source research information management system. And today, we're going to hear from my colleagues, Damaris Murray, who is the Director of Faculty Data Systems and Analysis at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina. Robert Miller, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Lyricis, a nonprofit organization serving universities and other cultural uh, institutions, and myself, and I am Director of Scholarly Communications at Texas A&M here in College Station, Texas. Research information management systems uh, collect and store structured data about um, faculty research, scholarly activities, and other information about their careers at universities. They're distinguished by several um, particular uh, characteristics. One is the authority of the data set that they represent on faculty profiles. They collect, often collect metrics, such as citations or alt metrics about the um, faculty research products and publications. And they often have common standards, ontologies or data models that define the data that are structured within RIM systems. Vivo is an open source uh, um, community member supported um, RIM system that is, uh, is supported by Lyricis and uh, has several um, specific core values. One is that it's an open source solution so that it can be customized and given freely away. That it's supported by an open community of members and enthusiasts who support the development and use of Vivo around the world, and that the data that is supported in, in Vivo and collected and organized in Vivo is then shared around the world, supporting the knowledge graph of academic research. And so it is an, a really important thing. Vivo is implemented at, by institutions and academic organizations around the world um, in about 60 different, 64 different inst instances now in 20 different countries. And um, this forms the overall Vivo community. First, we're going to hear from Damaris Murray, who is Director of Faculty Data Systems and Analysis on um, her system, Scholars at Duke. Damaris? Hi, everyone. I'm glad to talk to you today about Scholars at Duke. Uh, we've had it at Duke for about nine years now, and it was really exciting to see how Scholars at Duke was able to play a part um, throughout the institution, particularly throughout the pandemic. So I'll share a little bit about what Scholars at Duke is, and then I'll talk about um, specifically how it's come in handy the past year and a half or so. So Scholars at Duke is Duke's uh, implementation of Vivo. Um, we use it not only as a research information system, but also as an expert finding tool. And it hosts um, a lot of different visualizations and uh, search functionality that make it useful for several different functions across the university. Scholars at Duke, it contains not only information about Duke faculty, but also other community members that are um, engaged in research and teaching. Next slide. So uh, Scholars is very unique in that it houses information about Duke faculty in one place. Um, before Scholars at Duke, we didn't have a system where you could um, similar to a directory, you could search throughout the university for what sorts of research and, and activities um, were going on and really get a sense of the interdisciplinary work that, that is happening at Duke. So that's what Scholars at Duke um, does. It pulls from many trusted sources around the university um, and represents scholarship in a consistent way, regardless of whether you're affiliated with a certain school or institute or center. Next slide. So whether you're looking for information about a specific topic or an individual in the Duke community, um, Scholars has really been a, a trusted source and a place to find up-to-date content um, as it pulls from systems nightly. So we know it's always very um, up-to-date and whether you're just trying to manage your scholarly reputation or identify potential collaborators, um, Scholars at Duke has been the place where people know to go to kind of start that kind of work. Next slide. 
So our office is in uh, the Office of the Provost under Finance and Administration, which is a little bit different from other schools that have implemented Vivo. Although we do have very strong ties, not only with the library, but also um, research and administration, Duke Arts and Central IT. And what we've been able to do is kind of bridge the gap between um, several, several groups that don't necessarily work together, but have data about faculty. Um, this is an example of our FAQ page where we really use scholars at Duke as a place where faculty and others can come and start to ask questions. As they look through profiles, they start to ask deeper questions about where is this data coming from? How is it being collected? How can I change it? Uh, next slide. So really scholars at Duke has played a large role in kind of creating this grassroots data governance movement at Duke, where we try to involve a lot of people in managing profiles. And that means that there are a lot of people that get to be in these conversations around data governance, um, who needs to be trained in certain different systems, who needs access to the data, you know, how to keep data up to date and, um, and you know, ensure that it's quality information. So we've been really excited to see um, scholars at Duke and, and through Vivo kind of move beyond just, you know, research and or just profiles and really having these larger conversations about how things get changed and how data gets maintained. Next slide. So just a brief um, overview of the sorts of information. We have a lot of data that we have put into Vivo. Um, we have two universities, actually, uh, Duke Kunshan University and Duke University that we house in Scholars at Duke. And there are tons of schools, departments, and centers. And like I mentioned, uh, not only faculty, but also uh, students and staff that we see having profiles there too. And we've used a lot of the Vivo out of the box ontologies to kind of map all of this information. But we've also done a lot of custom work um, so that you know, we can make sure we're capturing people's scholarship in a, in a much more complete way. Next slide. So now that you've seen a little bit about what scholars at Duke is and what sorts of information are in there, I wanted to talk about three areas in which I feel that scholars at Duke has really supported um, Duke's resiliency throughout the pandemic. I wanna talk about um, the challenges of remote work, some of the financial issues that have come up, and then um, even conversations around diversity, equity, and inclusion, and how a system like this has really, has really helped. Next slide. So first, I want to just talk about the challenges of remote work, which we're all familiar with. I think something that um, we came up across a lot is that as people were moving to remote work, you know, the ways in which they found information or found the the information they needed to do their jobs had to change. Um, not everybody is tech savvy. A lot of people were used to just having conversations or maybe they had files on their desk that they couldn't access anymore. So we found that Scholars at Duke was a really good place for um, people to start to do their work in a different type of way, whether that was to identify groups of people that they needed to contact, um, there were new research policies that were put in place around Duke um, specifically for, you know, who needed to be in the lab at certain times or, you know, what sorts of research applied to different sorts of policies. And we have found that through Vivo and through putting that information into things like Tableau, people were able to do that work and identify those subgroups of, of researchers pretty quickly. <coughs> Um, just by getting a scholars at Duke profile that automatically meant that you would be searchable in these new Tableau reports that we set up pretty quickly. We could see, you know, who was doing COVID research. Um, people already knew, you know, that they should go and start tagging themselves with, you know, sort of COVID related terms on their profile. So it was pretty smooth, um, a smooth transition of getting people to uh, use scholars for these new kind of COVID related efforts and um, and tasks that they had. Uh, we also found that in terms of communication, uh, people wanted more communication, right? As they weren't seeing each other every day. And even though activities in the university had slowed down, the challenge was, well, how do we identify what is going on, you know, with events being canceled and everything. So what I'm showing here is actually a Tableau report coming from scholars at Duke 
that um, showed all of the, the news articles and you know, we allowed people to sh um, show what act teaching activities, teaching innovations that were happening. And that helped power the communications teams around campus to continue to kind of do their daily uh, communications and recognition efforts, even though they weren't actually uh, too many events going on. Next slide. So this is an example of a CV that we put together. Um, it's basically just you point and click and this a CV is generated uh, in a Word document based off of the information in your Scholars of Duke profile. And you'll see it's like very well formatted. This is actually the exact format that is required by Duke School of Medicine um, for review and, and promotion and tenure. So even in things like this, just simple administrative tasks, we recognize that faculty in particular had so much on their plate during the pandemic and just being able to have these small ways that we were showing that we knew they were doing extra work. We wanted to take something off of their plate. People really appreciated that, um, you know, we know we have all of these data and in, in systems, why are we making them enter it again? So just small little tasks that we knew could be better, could be automated, um, kind of rolling out tools like that really helped support people that we knew were already um, extremely busy. Next slide. So I also wanted to talk a little bit about financial challenges throughout the pandemic. There were a lot of resignations, reorganizations happening, cost cutting, particularly within IT groups. We saw a lot of that at Duke um, where IT groups were uh, shrunk or kind of merged together. And we have always used scholars at Duke to help power uh, local websites. So these are two examples here where, you're, where you'll see we make the data available through Drupal, through uh, embed code and, and JSON feeds different ways that it's very easy to reuse this information on local websites. So that really helped. And I think scholars at Duke, we knew um, Vivo and, and scholars were gonna last through the pandemic because it was driving and powering really so many of these websites that were losing staff to support them. Um, so even as redesigns were happening, we just saw more and more websites starting to move towards scholars data. One, um, example of something that happened is we had two centers that merged together and they needed a new website. And it was really, it literally took us maybe five minutes to, um, through the ontology, merge those two organizations together and scholars at Duke. And then, you know, we already had these feeds in place. They were able to, you know, set up a new website for those two merged groups within a day or so. So it was, um, it was really good to see that efficiency play out. Next slide. And then the last challenge I wanted to talk about was really with diversity, equity, and inclusion, where we saw um, departments and the institution at large really wanting to make sure they were aware of the types of um, people that we had, the amounts of effort that different uh, groups or individuals were responsible for, maybe not getting the recognition for that, making sure people could represent themselves the way they wanted to in terms of their varied interests, in terms of their preferred names, their pronouns, all of those things became much more, um, came to the forefront during the pandemic. And I think something like Scholars at Duke where people had questions like, how do I update my name in every system at Duke? I wanna be rec recognized this way. Or um, you know, now systems are kind of allowing pronouns to be, um, to be added. Like what are the security implications of things like that? These are all questions that have come up recently. And really those questions often happen and are answered around something like a scholars at Duke profile because that's where people think to go to first. So we've really had a role in being able to, um, I guess, guide people to the right, uh, the right resources around some of the ways in which they want to represent who they are and what they do and what they personally bring to the university. So with that, I'll just say that the future of scholars at Duke, we see it as very bright. Um, we're really excited about the way it has um, shown through, through a very difficult couple of years in the university setting. Uh, we just wanna do more to make it, you know, obviously more mobile friendly, more accessible, and make sure that even more people uh, are aware of what it can do and how it can help them uh, personally and also in their, in their departments and different tasks. 
So thank you. Thank you very much, Damaris. Um, now we'll turn uh, to scholars at Texas A&M and talk about how scholars had an important role in supporting faculty during the pandemic um, too, but in a very different way than what Damaris uh, talked about. Scholars at Texas A&M, uh, as opposed to the way that uh, it's done at Duke is organized and, and um, built in the libraries here at Texas A&M. Um, we have four major use cases that we're trying to uh, support through the use of our RIM system. Um, the first is improving faculty digital identity and reputation uh, by making their work more discoverable. Um, that uh, collaborations are supported, research collaborations um, are supported through the ability for researchers to discover other expertise. Um, especially in fields they're not that familiar with. Um, much like Duke does, uh, Texas A&M also uses our um, scholars data across campus for other systems. And then finally, we are using um, our scholars at Texas, Texas A&M system to support an emerging research intelligence group on campus. That's a collaboration between the library and the vice president of research. Um, Vivo at Texas A&M uh, was started, we started probably 2016, 2017, and, and one of the first um, important feedbacks that we got was actually building an, a very early version of uh, our scholars at Texas A&M system and showing the system to a focus group in the College of Medicine. And we had several um, people in the room and um, some of the people were extremely happy because they were very strong researchers and we were representing research very well. And so they saw themselves as, as being well represented and they just were quite satisfied. We had that one guy in the back and he was angry. And uh, what, what he contributed to the university was he was he was a lecturer he was a, an instructor and so his major contribution was teaching and when we showed him his profile of course it didn't have a lot of research um, and he thought it was just one more tool that a and was going to use to um, show that he was not doing a good job well what we've what we recognized very early on from that is that the openness of Vivo, the ability to customize our RIM because it's an open source solution was really important because we had a diverse set of faculty doing diverse things at Texas A&M. It's such a large university. It serves so many different needs that faculty have many different roles and we needed to represent those different roles. And so um, what the very first thing we did was we started harvesting data out of our institutional repository, which is also served by another open source uh, software package called DSpace, very common across the world, another Lyricist product, uh, in fact. And we started um, harvesting theses and dissertations that were chaired by faculty. And so you can see my own profile system and where we are representing the, the PhDs um, dissertations, the theses that I have chaired um, through my career as a geoscience faculty member. And in this way, we're helping to represent not only my research, but my educational activities. And that, and that became very, very popular. It was not an easy thing to do, um, mostly because uh, DSpace really had a folksonomy type of, uh, of metadata system because graduate students were, were uploading and entering the metadata uh, about their thesis and dissertation into DSpace all by themselves. And so uh, when we first started exploring this, um, my name was represented eight different ways in DSpace. Um, and so just having that challenge of identifying all of my theses and dissertations was was difficult, and so we had to we had to quite uh, work on this for um, a fair bit of time. But we got, we solved it, and it proved to be quite popular among faculty members. So we we've taken that lesson, 
And uh, especially during the pandemic, we started building other collections in our D space repository. So we have, um, we of course uh, have a collection around faculty research where faculty are um, curating and sharing with the world uh, preprints and, and, and research reports and other things related to their research. But we also developed uh, a new collection around teaching materials so that faculty could represent their excellence in the classroom, their role as a, um, a teacher scholar or um, represent the, the scholarship of teaching and learning that they may be engaged in. <laughs> and then finally, uh, finally, most recently, um, a and has been really focused on uh, enhancing student success of all our students. And a big part of that strategy um, in our student success initiative has been the greater use of open educational resource materials. And so we built a collection uh, to um, curate uh, TAMU authored OERs um, that are, are um, that were completed by Texas A&M faculty. And so we have that in our open OACs collection. And what we're doing is we're harvesting the metadata out of all of these collections um, and um, representing those works as part of the faculty um, profile so that you can, we can see faculty as truly the multi-dimensional um, professionals that they are serving many different needs that would, it would help support the overall um, land grant mission of Texas A&M. And so we're harvesting uh, the metadata out of DSpace. We're, we're passing that through our symplectic elements um, harvester system that we, we use uh, that comes from digital science. Uh, all of that data goes into a SQL database that is then crosswalked into the um, uh, into the um, uh, the the scholars at Texas A and M system. Faculty, of course, have always control over their profiles, so they can claim or reject any kind of uh, uh, data that we find for them, uh, because of course we are representing their reputation, and they have to have control over that message. And so what this does then is we're starting to harvest all these other um, uh, publications. Many of them are non-peer reviewed or the gray literature, the reports or uh, instructional sheets or teaching materials. It's, it's an amazing uh, collection of publications that faculty have found um, useful uh, to share with the world and pass through. And, and they all go into the publication section of our scholars at Texas A&M profile system. You can see some of the things that I've been sharing um, through our institutional or publishing through our institutional repository, our DSpace repository. Um, many of them are presentations about Vivo because I also serve as chair of the Vivo leadership group. Um, during the pandemic though, what we found was uh, as faculty transitioned to remote um, work, many of them uh, uh, came to my group and asked for help in publishing in new ways and often publishing things very rapidly. Um, they wanted to publish things in new ways. So what we did is we used um, our DSpace repository as, a, as a, a publishing platform. And one of the examples of uh, the kinds of things that were published was a survey that engineering faculty asked of their own students as the um, engineering faculty transitioned their classes from face-to-face -face classes to online learning. And uh, so they did a, a very large survey of a, a very large numbers of students and really highlighted with this survey the large number of problems that students were facing particularly um, students that uh, were coming from lower socioeconomic status, uh, where they were challenged by, um, by internet connectivity or spaces at home that they could work on, um, leading to uh, great challenges in learning. And uh, this, this survey, which they wanted to get out really, really fast, has really generated an amazing amount of interest for being unpublished and unpeer reviewed. Um, so, 
uh, if you can see here, we include in our DSpace repository uh, many kinds of, of metrics uh, that faculty can use to track the usage, engagement, and citation of their work. Uh, we also provide citations and so on. And this has really been um, quite effective, especially during the pandemic, where faculty are trying to reach new communities in new ways. Um, this work then, of course, uh, I got listed as a co-author because they were actually because they were nice, but because we helped, I helped them in several ways. And it gets represented um, in, on my profile as another type of work that we do. And, uh, and so um, all the authors had it represented on their page. And so this became really, uh, really important in the community. And we saw many, many faculty across all disciplines take advantage of it. Perhaps uh, the faculty member that was really um, successful and really changed her career was a great example, was a colleague of mine in the Department of Communications. Heidi Campbell is a distinguished professor uh, who studies um, churches and, and religious communities. Um, and she came to me uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, so it was kind of March of 2020, and said she had this idea of, of writing an edited volume where um, pastors and ministers and other religious figures and practitioners would write short vignettes about how their church or their religious community was being was um, being affected by and how they were responding to the pandemic. And she wanted to publish it quickly. She did. Uh, she is a humanities uh, faculty member and she's used to um, university presses being quite slow in producing um, published works. And so I talked to her about the use of, of DSpace as a publishing platform, how it would get represented in her scholar's profile and um, would help aid the discoverability, curation, and preservation of her work. And so she pursued it, and it was wildly successful. Um, in fact, she went off and uh, produced 23 other works in the same way, and has told me she's unlikely to ever go back to publishing uh, in a normal manner um, anymore. This work uh, has uh, went kind of viral on Twitter, has been picked up by newspapers around the world, um, has generated citations. Uh, it has really taken off because it was something where we could publish it quickly, get it out there. It's discoverable because it's a repository um, and she was able to share it. And so this idea of, of uh, building an interoperable system between these, our repository and our, our scholars at Texas A&M RIM system has proven really powerful for faculty to do new things under uh, extremely trying conditions. And so here she's, here she's announcing on Twitter her fifth ebook that she's published. And this was within one year. Um, so it was really quite uh, productive. It was a productive time for her, a time when she actually thought, how am I gonna do anything? has turned into one of the most productive and rewarding times of her life. Um, I, I, I like to exaggerate a little bit, but um, this of course, uh, garner, her books have garnered great attention around the world among religious communities. And, um, and in fact, it actually garnered her a uh, interview with the, with the Vatican, where they were asking her um, for her own, for advice on how the Catholic Church should respond to the pandemic. And so this has been really uh, wonderful. And it was building the system that allowed faculty to work in new ways under trying times has really um, shown, uh, shown its worth. Uh, so it was really pretty neat. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Robert Miller, who is the Chief Executive Officer of Lyricist. He's gonna talk about Vivo and a little bit more about Lyricist. Robert. Hey, Thanks, Bruce. Uh, good day, everybody. Damaris, thanks for the show and tell of what's happening at Duke. And Bruce, the uh, work that stretches from Texas to the Vatican, who would imagine that? Yes. There'd be a direct plane flight now from uh, <laughs> the Vatican back to, to, to Texas. Yeah, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> Just like to get to Houston. But 
Well, I have to tell you, Vivo is a, a very important part of Lyricist. And I thought what I would try to do in a few minutes is talk a little bit about the community supported software, um, how it fits within Lyricist and, and how Lyricist tries to add value on a program, which you can, I, I hope that the observers of this presentation can see really has a tremendous impact both inside and outside an institution. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how we add value to support as an organizational home, what that means. Um, and the short version is it's really where the volunteerism that you're hearing from Damaris and the internal people that use the tool and the system uh, and, and Bruce meet really a, a, a full-time support staff to help make sure that the trains run on time, that the software gets updated. And uh, Lyricist by design tries to outlast the volunteerism where people come, enter, contribute, and then move on in their careers with a program like, like Vivo. Um, I'll also share some of the, the topics uh, that we engage in uh, you know, outside of Vivo. For people who don't know Lyricist, we trace our roots back uh, to 1936 and 1937 out of the Great Depression. The librarians got together and said, novel idea, what if we shared resources? How good could we be if we worked together? And I think you've heard that theme through Damaris and Bruce and the programs they represent. Um, in addition to Vivo, we are the organizational home for DSpace, A-Space, C-Space, Fedora, Orchid, uh, even the Palace Project. Uh, it's a reading and content creation solution for public libraries and academic institutions. And the org home concept uh, migrates and stretches depending what a different community requires. Um, we brought DuraSpace into Lyricist in 2019, which we were honored in, uh, to be able to work with more R1s and tier two, three, and four, and an exciting group of non-US institutions on programs such as Vivo. Um, also with Vivo coming over from the DuraSpace were Fedora and, uh, and DSpace. Uh, this past year, we acquired a for-profit content services and software company called Bibliolabs. That also gives an organization and a project like Vivo tools and resources that they might not normally bump into every day. Um, our channels that we go after with our five divisions, as Bruce talked about, leads with academic, that's mostly what people associate us with, but public libraries, museums, archives, and increasingly the scientific community really has benefited from what Lyricist's expanded portfolio can bring to help um, the mission-driven work that we work on and the mission-driven work of our partners. We have a staff of about 80. We expect to be at about 100 in the next couple of years. So we're on a growth curve. Uh, we have over 1,800 institutions that we work with. We expect we'll be over 2,500 in the next couple of years. We do not depend on grants, but we use grants much like a um, you know, for-profit world of venture capital or raising money in the stock market might allow an institution to go forward. So this model that we have, we think really helps an organization like Vivo seek out sources of capital, funding, and resources as we go forward. Lastly, we've invested over $3 million back into programs um, that will impact and touch uh, programs like Vivo. Uh, these have been in the form of R&D, we call it business renewal, or direct grants from programs that an institution wants to take on and explore. Next slide, if you would. Our mission is pretty straightforward. We want to catalyze and enable equitable access to the world's knowledge and cultural heritage. Next slide, if you would. Bruce, I'm not sure you're a swimmer, and Damaris, I don't know if you are, but uh, as part of my triathlon training, I swim periodically. So swim lanes are pretty normal for me to go ahead and generate. So working with the Lyricist board, working with key academic institutions and channel members, these are the five areas that we focus on. And I think based on the remarks you've heard that Bruce made and Damaris made, you'll see that Vivo fits quite comfortably in the areas that we're looking at trying to help take our expertise and apply it generously, liberously in a nonprofit fashion uh, with the programs like Vivo. Next slide, please. Some of the things I think that Vivo has that to me signify that it's a program on the move and it's a move upward. Uh, in addition to what Bruce and Damaris have talked about, I think what I wanna point out as CEO is Vivo has the support of the community it has Clarivate as a partner, which I think is a novel concept of looking to for-profit and non-profit, that intersection and partnerships. Um, you'll see some of the other uh, names listed below in terms of some of the tombstones, uh, which I think also give cred credence and credibility to a program like Vivo. Are you on your own or who are you working with? 
Where do you live? Who do you hang out with? And I think as you look at the Viva community, where we hang out, it's pretty cool. Next slide, please. I love seeing these names of institutions that I think represent more than just they're involved. I think this is a seed strength. It's a capital strength. It's an asset strength that a program like Vivo has. When it has the horsepower of organizations like this who can not only set, set, set direction, but can add value on a long-term and be there day in and day out, it will help the next tier of users come in and say, well, geez, if Duke's involved and Texas is involved and Brown's there, maybe this is a program that's gonna last more than one semester. And I think that's something that's not initially thought, the investment that teams and institutions like Duke and, and Texas put into the, into the mix. Next slide, if you will. Governance. I know we just go crazy in academia when we make sure we have all the governance thought out, but it's important and it must be part of the conversation. I like the fact that Vivo has a user group. I love that Vivo, Vivo has an interest group, which is a little more casual relationship. But at the end of the day, there's a leadership group that steers and has a calm hand and a nimble hand on a tiller that's constantly being assaulted by the forces inside and outside what every program faces. And a committers group. And this is a struggle I think that all the community supported programs go with. Should we hire and have a dedicated set of people who can finish the software or do we depend on the community? The answer is yes. But I think each institution and each program has to turn the dial for what and where they have strengths. And I think this is something that Vivo has navigated successfully and ha really has as a forward-looking strategy. Next slide. I also, when I look at community-supported programs, take a look at where are they coming from, where are they, and what's their plan for the future. Um, thanks, Bruce, for putting it up there that they partnered with Lara says, I actually think that's a strategic advantage. Much like the airlines, you had other choices. And I hope what the community looks to is we can bring with unfettered access with complete transparency along with context. Can we give advice? Can we be that daily support that helps those ideas and visions that come from the community to be realized? Strengthening the governance. Um, every organization, much like the nation, when you change a president or you change the, the political structure, has to navigate this. And Vivo has done this successfully. So I would shout out and say, if you're worried about Vivo, I'm not because they know how to manage change. And they know how to engage change to move forward. The release, we're all getting better in the communities of how do we not delay and wait two, three, four, even five years for release. We're competing in a community of people with Facebooks and Amazons and Apples where releases come out weekly, daily, monthly. And so we have to get better in that area. And I think Vivo's made great progress there. Damaris, I had to smile when you said pandemic has caused stress. Oh my God, absolutely. And I'm so glad that Vivo has been able to alleviate some of that as we go forward. Next slide, if you would, please. Where are we today? Um, these things that touch here, you'll see virtual. But I think Vivo navigated the fact and used virtual as a strength going forward. It has not been a liability. So in this case, from a DEIA standpoint, I think we've learned things with Vivo that have made Vivo more successful. You'll see the, uh, the international who's showing up, where people are showing up and the conversations that are happening. And uh, coming from a German heritage and unable to speak Spanish, I was glad to see at least one of the two languages I have represented nicely there. Next, if you will. Where are we going? We know that from a UI standpoint, we can't just live off of library-driven Boolean code type methods of communication. We have to make it flexible and easy, and we have to demand better of ourselves. Vivo sees this, and Vivo is incorporating that in the releases they have. Vivo also is, understands that perhaps where the seed groups, those initial early adopters, created something that was phenomenal, but a tad complex now has something that's effortless to go ahead and use. And that's the North Star that, that Bruce has brought from a leadership standpoint and colleagues like Damaris are endorsing. So I think you'll see some really incredible things coming in the future. Next slide. Well, at the end of the day, sustainability tends to be a popular topic. And we always wanna make sure, how do we know how to pay for it as we go forward? I break things up into stages. At the early stage, of Vivo was at stage zero, which I would say is not meaning there's no value. It really was a gleam in a number of people's eyes. And Bruce, I forgot the story you sell, said about how you put it together originally. And typically it's grants or funders, founders that put that initial seed capital together. And it's, only, it's intellectual capital in addition to cash. Stage one, kind of the birth stage, we tend to default, and I found this working very closely with Thurisspace, the platinum, gold, silver medal. 
seems to get us to a certain part in the conversation. Where Vivo is right now is somewhere between stage one, stage two, and stage three. And I think that's healthy, and you should know this if you're even considering flirting with the idea of working with, with Vivo. The teenage stage, tier two membership, I think reflects a democratization of a program where it goes from really being run by a platinum member, a gold member, and a silver member. And with generosity, these institutions give what they think is fair. Ideally, we want to work to something where there's value that's clearly measured, value that can be assessed, and value that can be shown about how dollars are spent. So we spend a lot of time with Vivo thinking about that stage one, two, and three as we go forward. Next slide, if you will. I wanna wrap up Bruce and Damaris and, and hopefully compliment the great start you gave to these presentations and talk about things that go bump in the night. I think we're all faced with radical transformation. I think for us to be successful, Vivo and the projects that come across our desk that we invest in, we support or we're considering having a part of our portfolio to serve the patrons in the mission we have better. We need to be thinking about network effects, much like the telephone and Facebook, where service improves as more people use it. Service improves as more people use it. Can we create a virtuous circle where good follows good? Bruce, I like the email you sent me. I'm gonna send you something to read about that. You like something I say, you expand that, include Damaris. Damaris sees something else. She creates something for us out of her portfolio. That's the virtuous circle. It's like, God, I got to join Bruce, Damaris, and Robert because they have something going here. That's how the success of Evo is going to go forward. It's not a million-dollar campaign to try and buy our way into people's exposure. When do we build, buy, or partner? And I think Vivo looks at this candidly and bluntly. What do we want to own that's critical? What do we want to share that we need to? And how can we partner to go forward? So Clarivate, I think, is a key thing to point out in that discussion. The realities are, I think, coming from a for-profit, nonprofit, and mission-driven background currently, the cost of developing a channel can be five to 10 times at least higher than the cost just to write code. And one of the transformations I'm seeing in the community programs is we've been so focused on writing the code we don't recognize the channel that's there. Fortunately, we all are universities. We're connected with various organizations. So that channel development we have. So one of the things that Vivo is working on is how to engage and leverage that channel effortlessly, seamlessly, and frictionlessly as we go forward. Wide open opportunities. At Lyricist, we're looking a lot more about community engagement, but I thought we had that with a program like Vivo. But how do we really leverage community engagement? How do we take the content, and Bruce, that case study you talked about the Vatican, they really didn't care about the technology. They saw the story. It's the content being created. And whether a woman decides, a, co a colleague decides she's going to go back to an old or a new process is incidental. But it's the content creation that we don't have to pay for, but it transforms those that read and use it is critical. As I wrap up, it, fear, it appears to us that we have tools we can use. It takes a village. If you want to skim that, read that, it's something that we've used. It helped Lyricist work with Vivo. Um, we did a 10-point assessment, Bruce, and took a look at, at, at Vivo. And out of the 10 recommended things that might or might not help a program, I think we were at six. And where most people, Bruce, I think would go, oh my God, we only got a six out of 10 <laughs> failing. You said, holy mackerel, we have six. Let's yeah. pick the next four we want to go after. So we have tools now we can talk with each other. Damaris, I know you're a part of this also. So lastly, and I think I'm going to say this on behalf of my two colleagues here, is it too audacious to encourage a belief that we want to create a monopoly? We want to create a non-profit monopoly with software that is so good, no one would ever consider looking at another, another property, software, or act, you know, element to use. So a monopoly is not necessarily bad or good. It's something we can control. So I'd like to challenge all of us on this call as we listen. Let's be audacious. Let's take a program like Vivo, and let's create that monopoly that really creates change on a scale that nobody has seen before. Bruce, I'll hand it back to you. Damaris, thanks so much for letting me chat with you. I uh, thank you everybody for your attention. Um, I love giving talks with Robert and Damaris because they always think so small. Um, but please, if you're interested in learning more about Vivo or um, anything that Lyricist is doing, reach out to us and we would love to talk to you. Okay, thank you very much. Take it easy.